that better? <laughs> Do what? Oh, the children's church, all right. <laughs> Children are dismissed the children's church. They make such a beautiful addition to my audience, I hate to see them go. You know, that sounds like a pretty good trade to me to trade your sins and sorrows for the joy of the Lord, doesn't it you? Doesn't it you? Yes. Amen. Wonderful trade. And we can thank Jesus for that today. What a blessing it is. <laughs> You're what? Oh, is it? Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> I can't even see until my lights turn to right or wrong with me. <laughs> I want you to turn with me this morning to the 142nd Psalm. There have been some circumstances over the past few weeks in my sharing with people in our community that have led me to this text of Scripture. Psalm 40, Psalm 142. If you want to stand for the reading of God's Word, you feel free to do that. The psalmist says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication." I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I walked have they privately laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. You may be seated as we look to the Lord in prayer. Father, this morning we sense the de desperation of the psalmist, the loneliness of the one who penned this psalm. We sense, O oh God, frustration and anxiety. And yet, Lord, in the midst of a community where he found no one who cared for his soul, he came to the knowledge that God the Father would be his refuge, that God the Father would extend a helping hand, and that then in the community of the saints, you would deal bountifully with him. What a joy it is, O oh God, to know you today and to know, God, your compassion and your love, to find your grace sufficient, to know that your arm is not shortened to save us in any situation of life, but you're able. And, O oh God, it's our prayer that every person under the sound of our voice this morning would realize that there is one who cares for them. And, Lord, that this community would come to the realization there is one who cares for them. That our nation, once again, would turn back to you and know, God, that our help cometh from the Lord. There's no real help any place else. So God, speak to us today. Warm our spirits with your presence. Strengthen us with your hand. Fill us with your love and compassion. We pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. This morning, I'd like for us to consider together the subject of caring for the souls of men. Caring for the souls of men. Note our text again. In verse 4, the psalmist David said this, I looked on my right hand and beheld, and there was no man that would know me. Now think of that. There was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. Can you imagine someone feeling that despondent and lonely, that void of love from their peers? And yet, my friend, as your pastor, I must confess that I talk with people from time to time who've had similar testimonies. They felt as though their parents didn't care. They felt as though their companion didn't care. They felt as though there was no friend that truly cared about the circumstance of their soul. There are people about us in this community that feel the same way that Psalmist David felt. They're so anxious for someone to show concern and compassion for them. For someone to try to understand their predicament in life. For someone who's willing to put on their shoes and walk where they walk and know the pressures and the trials and anxieties that they face on a daily basis. Now, not only are there people who have this feeling, and this is what amazes me, different from what the psalmist David says in this psalm, there are people I've talked to who have no inward assurance that even God cares for them. Now, that's hard for us who name the name of Jesus to comprehend or understand. But I've talked with people who have no inward assurance that even God cares about their situation and about their circumstance. And I question within my heart as I was meditating upon this text, why would that be? And God quickly stated to me and impressed upon my heart, could it be because of the failure of the church who are filled with compassion and the love of God? How could anyone in our community feel this way if we the church are at God's feet and hands and we're filled with the love of God? How could anyone not know that God loves them? Are we failing to bear a testimony of God's compassionate love to our neighbors and those down the street and those in our community? I said, Lord, am I failing to make known to the people I come into contact with that God loves them? He wants to help in their situation. He wants to bring victory in their life. He wants their families to be healed and restoration of their needs. My friend, it's the church's responsibility to allow people the privilege of knowing as you and I know that God cares for us. He loves us, amen? He loves us and He cares for us and we must communicate that message to the community in which we live. My friends, how we need to tarry before God until the Holy Spirit sheds abroad in our heart the love of Jesus Christ. That you and I might be moved with compassion and concern for other people. I believe it's when that happens that revival will truly come. I believe that when we, as the church body of Christ, are filled with compassionate love. And we look upon the multitudes as Jesus did, and he said he was moved with compassion upon them. God, help us to be moved with compassion. The most dangerous thing we're facing today is not the economy. 
The most dangerous thing we're facing today is not the Syrian conflict. The most dangerous thing we're facing today is not world turmoil and an absence of leadership in some higher places. The most dangerous thing we're facing is losing the compassion of God for people that are about us. When the church can shed tears over the needs of their neighbors, when the church can shed tears over the needs of people that we're aware of, that stand in so much need. And if we're not aware of it, we ought to be knocking on doors and making friendships with those in our community. We're living in a community that's hurting. You say it's their own fault. They could come to church. My friend, they don't even know God cares for them. And we have a responsibility as a family of God to let Christ's love move us into sharing God's love with others. I believe revival will come when American churches are once again filled with compassion for those about them. As we ponder this thought, I want us to ask ourselves, are we guilty of the sin of unconcern? Are we guilty of the sin of unconcern, of something outside our family circle, of something outside our personal needs? Are we drawn to people that are in darkness and need the light of God? I believe with all my heart we're guilty of unconcern if we're professing to be children of God and not living by the compulsion of God's compassion and love, which comes through the infilling of the Holy Spirit of God. My friends, God can only bless us to bless others when the channels of our life are cleaned out of selfishness and sin and personal concern to the point he can use us to help others. You know, I found in my life, my concerns and my personal needs begin to diminish when I see the needs of others about me. When I see how blessed my family is in comparison to the families of others. When I see how great the need is about me, my problems begin to diminish and my heart begins to go out to others and the need for me to be their link with a loving Heavenly Father. For that reason, all known sin must be dealt with in our lives and a complete surrender to God must be made. When the channels of our lives are filled with blockades, The power of God's love cannot flow through us to those about us. We're also guilty of unconcern when we're not faithful to God and to His church and to the Great Commission. I told Pat this morning I wasn't going to say this, but I am. One of our members was sitting in Jack's early this morning and they were watching a preacher on television. And this member said, a black man spoke up and he said, you know, I just, it just dawned on me what's wrong with our churches. He said, if we had the same uni- unity and the same devotion and the same power of the Spirit for our favorite football team in our churches. Wow, what a difference it made. He said, you know, black and whites come together for the various football teams. 
black and white, sit together, cheer together for their favorite team. He said, but in the church, we can let the least little thing diminish our unity and our fellowship. He said, and we've got the greatest team on earth, the body of Christ, the church of the living God, and we let Satan sidetrack us when it comes to spiritual things. My friend, we're in a battle. The forces of good and evil. And the people about us need to hear of the love of God. They need to be given the hope that only Jesus can give. We're certainly guilty of unconcern. for our brothers in need and our sisters in need and our young people in need if we've shut up our bowels of compassion toward them. I pray that God will baptize brother and sister Absher all over again with greater compassion for the people of this community, the people of this nation, and the people of this world. May we never grow comfortable in our environment when thousands upon thousands of souls are dying and going to a devil's hell without ever hearing of the love of God. Realizing that this sin of unconcern is a real possibility, we need to examine together what it is that brings on this spirit of unconcern in the church. God said to me it begins when we begin to backslide in certain areas of our life. The things that we once would never thought of doing in terms of our faithfulness and our commitment we now do with little thought. And so we begin to backslide in certain areas of our life. We may not be in the word like we should or in prayer like we should or faithful to the body or serving in the body as we should. And we just begin to backslide and slip back from our first love. It continues then as we grow lukewarm and indifferent to the things of God. And the first thing that happens when we begin to backslide is we begin to watch others as justification. We begin to find fault and criticize and nothing seems to be right. And somehow it brings some sense of justification for where we are spiritually. And then Satan begins to lie to us and deceive us about our own spiritual condition. And then finally, as the Bible states, the church becomes at ease in Zion. There's no spark. There's no enthusiasm. There's no zeal. There's no unity of working to reach others for Christ. We're not compelled every week to have on our agenda other people and their needs. It's all about us. How the church needs to be awakened from this spiritual slumber if we're going to help other people in their hour of distress. Truly, my friends, there's cause for concern. How we should be concerned for our own selves and our own family. Because the half-hearted will not make heaven their home. The backslider will not make heaven his home. The lukewarm and indifferent will not make heaven their home. God said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. The revelator says, I'll blot your name out of the Lamb's book of life. We don't make it on past histories or upon our heritages in this church. We make it through our personal relationship with Christ and keeping it up to date and growing in Him and sanctified by His Spirit filled with His love and compassion, 
on charge for God, excited about His work. We don't count it as some drudgery task. Brother, we look forward to it because it's our mission in life. As Jesus came to seek and save the lost, He's commissioned us to do the same. And our circle of influence will be held accountable for what we're doing outside of our families to reach others for Jesus Christ. We should also be concerned for our families. As our children grow up, they think important what we think is important. And if we can profess to know Christ and be ready to go to heaven and we're living backslidden lives in areas of our life, don't think they don't know it. But it becomes the norm for their lives. And so we influence others that we have greatest concern for and our desire for them to make heaven their home how we should be concerned for other people today. Many are lost in their sin without a ray of hope. All who do not know Jesus do not know the joys of sonship. They have no idea of what we've experienced at some point in our lives. They're going to miss heaven. Miss heaven, far worse than cancer, far worse than heart attack, far worse than losing infants, far worse than anything you can imagine. Miss heaven, unprepared to meet God. They face eternity in hell. Prepared for the devil and his angels. Oh, my friend, there's too much at stake to not be concerned for those about us. I ask you again, are we concerned? Can I tell you something? If we truly are, it's going to cost us our time. If we're truly concerned, it's going to cost our time. Every week, it's going to cost our time. It's going to cost our talents in our abilities. Every week, it's going to take our energies, our brain trust, our time and talents and all that we have. It'll cost our treasures. We will give to missions. We'll give to the church. We'll be faithful in our giving. But most importantly, it's going to cost your testimony and my testimony. People will only know of the love of God as we build relationships with people and teach them what the love of God is all about. I'm not simply talking about knocking on a door and handing out a survey. I'm not simply talking about going to homes and invite people to church. I'm talking about building relationships with people which takes time takes time from our hobbies, takes time from our family time. It takes time to build relationships with people and to share with them the love of God. To encourage us at this point, remember God was so concerned for us that He sent us His only begotten Son the Lord Jesus Christ. He came in the flesh and His own received Him not. The child of promise was rejected by the Jewish nation. The religious scholars of His day persecuted Him, jeered Him. And ultimately cried, crucify, crucify, crucify. And Jesus died alone for you 
and for me. Not that we could selfishly hoard the love of God, but that we could be channels through which His love flowed to other people, that we could let the hurting of our society know God cares for you. Red, yellow, black, and white. <laughs> Homosexuals, lesbians. Share Jesus with people that are hurting in this world and need deliverance by the power of God. God cares for us. Aren't you glad he does? <laughs> Can't imagine where I would be or where our children would be if I hadn't learned early in life that God loves me. But I'm so thankful too that my parents taught me, Wayne, he not only loves you, he wants to love others through you. And we've tried to teach our kids that. Pray for them. They're going through a lot of trials and persecutions. Not at the hands of a hurting society but at the hands of God's people. I talked to so many young pastors today that are willing to throw in the town because of the criticism at the hands of God's people. If we would spend as much effort in loving this community, now I don't think you're doing that to me, or at least I can't hear well enough to know you are. <laughs> But if we would, as churches, would spend enough, as much energy praying for the pastors and the men of God that have left family and home and gone to where God's called them to do His bidding, supporting them, encouraging them, and then following their instruction. I'm so glad this morning it doesn't matter what our needs are. Our God is able to meet them. If he wasn't, this would be my last sermon. But I know he is. And I know he's just waiting for those who will say, it's not my brother, it's not my sister, but Lord, it's me that stands in the need of prayer. I want to be a channel of your love. If it's through baking a cake, it's through having someone over for dinner, it's, if it's visiting on the back, I don't care what it is. I want to help others know how much you love them. It's too good to keep to ourselves. Amen. I can't tell you the people who've come to me since I've been here. Brother Abster, have you ate here? <laughs> Man, is it good, and I've tried it, and it was good. Well, I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, and I want people to sit down at his table. Don't you? Won't you have your needs met this morning so that you can share God's concern with other people as he wants you to do? You say, well, Brother Ephraim, I've been doing some things, and I commend you for that. But how much more does God want us to do? Remember, he won't ask us to do anything, but that he'll give us the power to accomplish it. Let's stand together as we look to him in prayer. Father, how we thank you this morning for your presence here. How I thank you for Rock Creek Church of God and how good they've been to me and Marie and our family through the years. And Lord, I'm just asking that they shower the same love upon our community. 
Lord, we've got to reach out. Brother Absher can't do it by himself. I can touch some people. But when every one of us sense the need of being filled with your compassion and doing as you've gifted us and equipped us and given us talent and begin to think outside of our own circle and begin to reach out to hurting people, it's going to amaze us how it will enrich our lives and excite us when we see friends and neighbors and loved ones bowing at altars and allowing Jesus to take first place in their life. Oh God, the joy bells of heaven are going to begin to ring and all of the things that have seemed so major will become so minor in our fellowship and our focus will be upon you and how much you love us and how much you love others and how we want them to know it. So God, touch us today. Help us, Lord, to respond to your love in a way that we haven't in a long time. And to let you shed abroad in our hearts your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.